Before trying Beam Dream Powder, it was so difficult to wind down before sleep. And with fewer hours and poor sleep, it was affecting my energy for the next day to give it my all at the gym and creating content for you all. But after the first week of using Beam Dream Powder, I felt those yawns hit ASAP, hitting the hay faster and feeling a deeper, rejuvenated sense the next day. But what is Beam Dream Powder? It's a cup of healthy hot cocoa formulated to help you get your best night's sleep. It comes in a variety of ingredient variations and flavors, customizable to your lifestyle. I absolutely love the chocolate peanut butter flavor, and they even have versions with or without CBD, guaranteeing that you get a more restful night's sleep and wake up feeling more refreshed. And with the delicious taste at only 15 calories and the improved mood that I get from a great night's slumber, it's all such a huge benefit to my daily routine. And now is the only time Beam is up to 50% off. Take advantage of Beam's biggest sale of the year with its limited time offer. And the numbers don't lie. In a clinical study, 93% of participants reported Dream helped them get a better night's sleep. Go to shopbeam.com slash let's read, link down below, or scan the QR code on screen to shop Beam's biggest sale and get up to 50% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. The discount is auto-applied, so no code necessary. That's shopbeam.com slash let's read, linked in the description or pinned comment below. in death, my powers continue. Vladimir Mikhailovich Komarov was born on March 16th of 1927 in the Russian capital of Moscow. Nicknamed Volodya by his loved ones, little Vladimir grew up among Moscow's snow-dusted streets with his mother, father, and half-sister. And although his childhood was marked by periods of great political upheaval, little Volodya was happy. But just as he was about to enter high school, one of the largest and most costly battles in human history would turn Western Russia into an inferno of hatred and bloodshed. In 1941, Germany sent an invasion force of over a million men to subdue the Soviet Red Army. And as Stalin called for a general mobilization, life in the USSR changed for each and every one of its 205 million citizens. Vladimir and his family were evacuated from Moscow, then put to work on a collective farm-growing group to support the war effort. Conditions were brutal and provisions were scant, but one day, young Vladimir looked up into the skies above the farm and saw an angel. There, drifting through the clouds, thousands of feet above him, was an airplane. Having grown up in Moscow, Vladimir had seen airplanes before, but being confined to the collective farm had forced a sharp change of perspective. Now the thing that floated in the skies above him became the most beautiful thing he'd ever laid eyes on. It was elegant, it was graceful, and it was free. From that day forward, Vladimir was obsessed. He collected magazines and postcards depicting the fighter and bomber planes of the Soviet Air Force and begged his father to secure him a model airplane kit as well as the glue required to piece it together. Vladimir's father did everything he could to secure the model kit for his beloved young son and during Christmas of 1941, he found one. Little Vladimir was overjoyed but, tragically, it was the final gift he would ever receive from his father. Mikhail Komarov was drafted into the Red Army soon afterwards and was killed during the summer fighting of 1942. Little Volodya was utterly devastated and swore revenge against the German invaders. The following year, Vladimir took one step closer to his dream when he managed to gain a place in the first Moscow Air Force school. By the time he graduated, he was itching to face off against the aerial combat aces of the Luftwaffe, but before Vladimir had a chance to avenge his father's death, the Red Army stormed Berlin, Hitler took his own life, and the war in Europe came to a close. Vladimir was bereft, yet like so many of us whose hopes or dreams are dashed by circumstance, he simply shifted his goals slightly and continued on the road to destiny. In 1946, Vladimir transferred to the Soviet's Advanced Air Force School in Voronezh. The course, which consisted of advanced flight training for the Soviet's new state-of-the-art jet fighter, took three years to complete. 
Vladimir had hoped that his one remaining parent would be able to attend his graduation ceremony, but sadly his mother passed away just seven months before he was due to attain his flight wings. He was then posted to Grozny in Chechnya, married a woman named Valentina, and soon found himself promoted to the prestigious post of chief pilot at the 486th Fighter Aviation Regiment. Vladimir's rise through the ranks of the Soviet Air Force was nothing short of meteoric, but still, he wanted more. By 1959, Vladimir had been promoted to the rank of senior engineer lieutenant, but upon being congratulated by his superiors, he made a very unusual request of them. Vladimir asked to be transferred to the Central Scientific Research Institute at Chokolovsky, and when asked why, he replied that he wanted to become what's referred to as a test pilot. A test pilot has additional training to fly and evaluate experimental, newly produced and modified aircraft with specific maneuvers, known as flight test techniques. The role can be an incredibly dangerous one, and only the most courageous and skilled of pilots are eligible to apply. However, Vladimir's time as a test pilot was cut short following a surprise visit from his commanding officer. He was told that what he was about to hear was top secret, highly classified information, and that if he disclosed any of it, he would be stripped of his rank and thrown in prison. Daunted but also intrigued, Vladimir made clear that he understood and the officer continued. Vlad was one of just 3,000 Soviet pilots who had been selected for a brand new training program. This program would take the nation's best aeronauts, then instill them with the training and mentality required to explore the final and perhaps most significant of all unexplored frontiers, outer space. His candidacy was successful and in March of 1960, Vladimir was sent to the newly established Cosmonaut Training Center just outside of Moscow. He proved more than qualified, but failed to make it into the top six candidates due to not meeting the very specific age, height, and weight restrictions laid out by the architects of the Soviet space program. However, Vlad had more experience than the other candidates combined, so despite not technically meeting the program's physical requirements, he was selected along with a handful of others. In 1961, the first space flights began, but it was a bittersweet moment for Vladimir. From the day he was invited into the cosmonaut program, Vlad had dreamed of being the first man in space. He was exceptionally happy for his close friend and fellow cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, who was instead granted the honor of being the first human being in outer space, but was only truly able to accept the missed opportunity once it was assured that one day, he too would see the ocean of stars that Gagarin had described. It took three more years to gain a place on a planned space flight, but in July of 1964, Vladimir was selected as the primary crew commander for a mission named Voskhod 1. On October 11th of 1964, Vladimir undertook the long-standing tradition of collecting totems and trinkets from those who would remain on Earth for the duration of the mission. To own something, sometimes as innocuous as a pencil, that had been into space was considered a great honor, and every cosmonaut understood that the ground crew was just as crucial to their survival and success as the very spacesuits they donned and the rockets they flew. All that considered, ferrying some of their belongings into the heavens and back was the very least a cosmonaut could do to thank them, and the next day, he saw space for the very first time. 24 hours following his departure, Vladimir's descent module had landed back on Earth and he was welcomed as a hero. He received an instant promotion to Colonel and was awarded the Order of Lenin before being bestowed the official title of Hero of the Soviet Union. Komarov had become a superstar, and the awe and admiration in which he was held could quite easily be compared to the kind contemporary Americans feel for their professional athletes. He was invited onto state radio stations, appeared in several Soviet propaganda films, and even featured on a series of postal stamps commemorating the success of the Volstadt One mission. Little Volodya, who had once dreamed of soaring through the skies, was a national hero. Yet strangely, he found fame and glory meant nothing to him. All he wanted in the whole wide world was to return to the void above it. 
Throughout the mid-1960s, scientists at the Soviet space program began working on a new generation of rocket technology. The innermost reaches of space had been conquered. The next target was the moon. But to get there, the Soviets would not only need to develop a new, much more powerful launch rocket, they'd need to design an entirely new kind of spacecraft too. They poured their time and energies into the project for two years straight, with all crewed space flights being suspended in that period. By the time the project was ready for testing, every cosmonaut in the Soviet Union was desperate to be a part of it. But of the thousands trained and ready for launch, only Vladimir Komarov was chosen for what came to be known as the Soyuz missions. In order to save valuable time and resources, Soviet scientists made the decision to tailor the first of their cutting-edge space flights to just a single solitary cosmonaut. And since Vladimir was perhaps the most experienced test pilot in the entire Soviet Union, it made perfect sense to ensure his candidacy. As you can imagine, Vladimir was immensely proud of his selection and accepted the opportunity with gratitude. But underneath the veneer of Soviet progress, he quickly discovered some serious flaws. The first three Soyuz test flights were catastrophic failures. Following the first and second failures, Vladimir expected at least some degree of progress, but after the third test flight ended with the launch rocket exploding in a fireball of liquid kerosene, he realized something was horribly wrong. Test flights are supposed to get more and more stable with each and every launch, but in the case of Soyuz 1, they seemed to be getting more and more dangerous. Following the end of the Cold War, a close friend of cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin shared some shocking information regarding the first Soyuz mission. Vinyamin Rusayev, a former KGB agent, claimed that engineers reported a jaw-dropping 203 design faults to party leaders prior to Soyuz 1's launch. Their reports came in waves, with a deluge coming after the failure of each test. But time after time, the Soviet leadership dismissed their concerns and insisted the launch preparations be completed by April 22nd, the date of Lenin's birthday. Rusyev also claimed that upon realizing that Soyuz 1 was subject to extreme undue risk, Yuri Gagarin himself attempted to have Vladimir removed from the mission. Given his status, Gagarin's high echelon friend granted his wish, but when given the option, Vladimir insisted on remaining Zoyuz 1's pilot. It's likely that Vladimir knew all too well that if removed from the mission, one of his closest friends or co-workers would be chosen to take his place. And so, rather than condemn another to what he saw as his fate, Vladimir went ahead with the mission. Finally, just after midnight on April 23rd of 1967, Colonel Vladimir Komarov took off into space, the first Soviet cosmonaut ever to do so twice. The Soyuz 11A511 rocket held true and propelled Vladimir beyond Earth's atmosphere without any kind of catastrophic failure. The ground crew were jubilant, yet their celebrations were cut short because almost immediately after detaching from the launch rocket, the Soyuz 7K OK space capsule began to suffer complications. The first came when one of the capsule's solar panels failed to fully unfold, forcing it to operate on only 50% of its maximum power supply. This led to issues with the capsule's orientation detectors, which made maneuvering it almost impossible. Less than an hour later, the capsule's automatic stabilization system was failing, and the manual system for doing so was only partially operational. In essence, this left Vladimir stranded in space, with his oxygen reserves quickly running out. The crew of the second Soyuz mission, Soyuz 2, thought that it would be months before it came their turn to cross the final frontier. But when the news came that their mission date had been drastically brought forward, there were no celebrations. Their mission was no longer to advance the lunar landing project. It was to rescue Colonel Vladimir Komarov, hero of the Soviet Union, and bring him home alive. Their plan was to launch themselves into space using the hastily fueled Soyuz 2 rocket. There, they could navigate their way to Komarov's capsule, make all the necessary repairs, and then guide his descent into Earth's atmosphere before following suit. Yet on the night of the Soyuz 2's scheduled launch, 
A freak electrical storm struck the Baikonur launch pad they planned to use, frying the rocket's boosters and delaying the rescue mission by a minimum of 24 hours. This gave Komarov two choices. Remain stranded in space and slowly suffocate as his oxygen reserves ran dry, or attempt to manually steer the Soyuz 1's capsule through Earth's atmosphere in a way that wouldn't have it bursting into flames due to intense heat and friction. He chose the latter. After just 90 minutes in space, Colonel Vladimir Komarov fired his capsule's retro rockets and began his descent into the upper thermosphere. At first, everything went as planned. Komarov managed to orient the capsule correctly, its retro rockets performed exactly as intended and its heat shields appeared to be holding. Everything is going fine, he called out over his radio, as if in jubilant surprise at how a capsule he'd once considered doomed was actually holding up against the rigors of atmospheric re-entry. Once the capsule had reached an appropriately low altitude, Komarov deployed its drogue parachute designed to slow the capsule to a speed at which a larger, regular parachute can effectively function. The drogue deployed perfectly, and as the news made its way to the mission's control room, the ground team breathed a deep collective sigh of relief. Minutes later, Komarov reached the speed at which he should deploy his primary parachute, but when he triggered its release, nothing happened. He tried again, yanking the release over and over, but still the primary parachute didn't deploy. Komarov didn't panic. The release system's manual override switch was right there in front of him. He leaned forward, pulled the switch, then heard a loud bang as the parachute was sent hurtling into the skies above him. Yet the capsule didn't slow down. The primary parachute had become entangled in the drogue, rendering both ineffective. Instead of slowing down, the Soyuz-1 capsule continued to hurtle towards the surface of the Earth at speeds bordering on 100 miles an hour. What happened next had been disputed by historians of the Soviet space program, but legend has it that, as Komarov fell to his death, U.S. spy stations located in eastern Turkey picked up his final radio transmission. The rumors claimed that once he realized just how doomed he was, Komarov had a complete nervous breakdown while hurtling towards his death. He cursed the Soviet leadership, tearing into them for valuing political prestige over human life. He then launched into a message he wished the ground crew to give to his wife, imploring them to make it clear that his final thoughts were of her, and her alone. He then reportedly yelled, You've killed me. You've killed me. Over and over again. Then let out one long final scream before his transmission suddenly ceased. Some historians have disputed that, claiming that the only negative word picked up by unbiased Russian translators was killed. Komarov might well have remained as composed as possible until the very end and merely used the word killed in a different context to his own impending death. But either way, as the capsule smashed into the earth of Russia's Orenburg Oblast, Vladimir was killed in an instant as it violently burst into flames. When a rescue helicopter arrived at the scene, the crew discovered that the Soyuz-1 descent module had almost completely disintegrated as a result of the impact and subsequent fire. They worked quickly to douse the flames, but by the time they'd been extinguished, Colonel Komarov's body was barely recognizable as human. Komarov was posthumously declared a hero of the Soviet Union for the second time and received a televised state funeral before his ashes were interned in the Kremlin Wall necropolis in Red Square. News of his death sent shockwaves through those involved in the space programs of both America and the Soviet Union. Spaceflight obviously came with a huge amount of risk, risks which all astronauts and cosmonauts were aware of. Vladimir's fate represented all their worst nightmares. Trapped in a tin can, hurtling towards the Earth, aware of what's happening to the very end. Killed by the incompetence of those who'd never even flown a kite, let alone a space shuttle. Prior to his departure from the surface of the moon, Neil Armstrong placed a small package of memorial items to honor Komarov, Yuri Gagarin, and the Apollo 1 astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. In all likelihood, this package will remain on the moon for hundreds if not thousands of years. 
Komarov's lunar memorial might well still be there once some of the monuments here on Earth have been eroded or destroyed, either by nature's wrath and reclamation or man's own folly. Giving him, as well as the other astronauts memorialized by the package, the closest thing to immortality that's ever likely to exist. On June 6th of 1971, the 11th Soyuz space mission was launched from the USSR's Baikonur Cosmodrome, deep in Soviet Kazakhstan. Its goal was to successfully dock with the Salut space station, the first of its kind and the pride and joy of the Soviet Union. Yet several months prior, a failed attempt to complete the exact same mission had proven an international embarrassment. The Russians had a point to prove, and to do so, they put together a crack team of their best cosmonauts, including Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsyev. The flight up to the space station went off without a hitch, but since the space station was unmanned, docking became a long and arduous process engaging various electrical and hydraulic links, then establishing airtight seals before airlocks could be opened. Once the pressures between the space station and the cosmonauts' spacecraft had equalized, the three men had the honor of being the first to enter an orbiting space station in human history. But the moment they did, they realized something was very wrong. At first, the Salut appeared to be in good working order, but the cosmonauts quickly noticed a smoky, burnt residue around some of the space station's air vents. The cosmonauts had received no warning that any kind of fire had broken out, but as a precaution, they set about replacing the parts of the ventilation system which appeared faulty, then spent the next 24 hours back in their spacecraft until they were certain that it was safe to re-embark. The next small scare came when one of the cosmonauts attempted to use the space station's exercise treadmill. Due to the low levels of gravity present aboard the station, cosmonauts embarking on long stays would be subject to severe levels of muscular atrophy. To combat this, the Soviets supplied the Salut space station with its very own exercise equipment, yet while it's undoubtedly an appreciated amenity, it proved dangerously and terrifyingly impractical. During the first instance in which the cosmonaut attempted to run on the treadmill, which had been specifically adapted to function in zero gravity, the Salute's outer hull began to tremble and shake. The effect was so profound that the cosmonauts feared the space station itself might begin to rupture, so after calling a halt to their colleague's workout, the treadmill remained untouched for the duration of their stay. Omitting any mention of the fire or the ineffective exercise equipment, the Soviet Space Agency organized a live broadcast with a salute just over a week into the cosmonaut's stay. The broadcast became a national televisual spectacle, with millions upon millions of Soviet citizens crowding around their TV sets to view images beamed down from the heavens. The cosmonauts claimed everything was just fine and talked of how well their research was progressing. Soviet citizens ate it up, believing the entire mission was going off without a hitch but they couldn't have been more wrong. On the 11th day of the mission, the Salute space station's fire alarms began to blare. His ventilation system, the same one which showed signs of charring when the cosmonauts first entered, had once again caught fire. It goes without saying that uncontrolled fires are a huge threat to human life, but up in space, they are ten times as deadly. Fires can destroy a spacecraft's life support systems, turning them into floating steel coffins, and in an environment where oxygen is a precious commodity, uncontrolled burns pose a deadly threat. Upon hearing the alarm, the cosmonauts sprang into action, utilizing the Salute's onboard fire suppression system to douse the flames and end the threat. But the damage had already been done. The fire had burned through a huge portion of the Salute's oxygen reserves, the mission had to be cancelled. Prior to their departure, the cosmonauts used what little time they had left aboard the station to finish up whatever research projects they could. Then after loading the descent module up with specimens, films, tapes, and other gear, they made their final preparations to leave. Finally, on June 29th of 1971, 
The Soyuz 11 capsule undocked from the Salute space station at exactly 628 Universal Time. The cosmonauts guided the craft into a slow orbit for approximately four hours, then fired its retro rockets and began the descent back to Earth. At the time, it was perfectly normal for a mission's ground team to temporarily lose contact during a descent, as a portion of Earth's atmosphere, known as the ionosphere, was known to disrupt communications. However, in the case of the Soyuz 11, communication suddenly ceased just prior to the regularly expected window. This didn't cause too much alarm down at Mission Control, who had obviously expected some kind of communications blackout. And when the Soyuz 11's capsule landing systems functioned correctly and without incident, it appeared as if all was well. The capsule landed back in Kazakhstan at exactly 1116 Universal, with the mission's recovery team on standby in the vicinity. But once they arrived at the landing site and pried open the capsule's hatch, they made a horrifying discovery. Georgi Dabravolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev were all dead. Chair of the Soviet State Commission Karim Karimov later spoke of what the recovery team saw that day. On the outside of the capsule, there were no signs of damage whatsoever, he said, but then the team knocked on the hall and there was no response. Then when they opened the hatch, they found all three men in their couches, motionless, with dark blue patches on their faces and trails of blood coming from their noses and ears. They removed them from the descent module. The Brovolsky was still warm. The doctors gave artificial respiration, and based on the reports, the cause of death was suffocation. After a brief investigation, it was discovered that a ventilation valve located between the orbital module and the descent module had been jolted open as the two separated. This depressurized the interior of the descent module at an altitude of 105 miles, and given that it was located under the cosmonaut seats and thus impossible to reach and block, rapid decompression induced cardiac arrest in all three cosmonauts in less than 60 seconds. Following their recovery, the men's bodies were transported to the Berdanko Military Hospital in Moscow, and after a lengthy analysis, doctors determined that the actual cause of the cosmonauts' death had been hemorrhaging of the blood vessels in the cosmonauts' brains. Doctors also found smaller amounts of blood had leaked under their skin, in their inner ears, and in their nasal cavities, all of which occurred as exposure to a vacuum environment caused the oxygen and nitrogen in their bloodstreams to bubble and rupture the fragile blood vessels that contain them. As news of the tragedy spread uncontrollably, the Soviet leadership instructed state-run media companies to downplay the tragedy by highlighting the so-called essential research that had been completed. Space exploration was an incredibly dangerous pursuit, and the brave, selfless cosmonauts understood the risks they took. That was the official explanation. They made no mention of such a basic design flaw being the cause of the cosmonauts' deaths. It took two whole years for the truth to finally emerge. The cosmonauts were given a large state funeral and buried in the Kremlin Wall Necropolis at Red Square, Moscow, near the remains of the recently deceased Yuri Gagarin, who had died on a routine training flight just a few years prior when his MiG-15 UTI malfunctioned and crashed. Upon reaching the shores of the U.S., President Richard Nixon issued a statement to the American people. We express our deepest sympathy on the tragic deaths of the three Soviet cosmonauts. The whole world followed the exploits of these courageous explorers of the unknown and shared the anguish of their tragedies. But the achievements of cosmonauts Dobrovolsky, Volkov, and Patasev remain. It will, I am sure, prove to have contributed greatly to the further achievements of the Soviet program for the exploration of space and thus the widening of man's horizons. Following the sudden and tragic loss of life, the Soyuz spacecraft was designed to carry just two cosmonauts. The extra room meant that each cosmonaut could don a state-of-the-art Sokol spacesuit during launch and landing. The Sokol was a light pressure suit intended for emergency use, but was found to be so effective that updated versions of the suit are used by cosmonauts even today. At the sites of Soyuz 11's landing, a three-sided metallic column was erected as a memorial to the fallen cosmonauts. Fashioned as a stylized triangle, 
Each open face depicts an engraved image of each fallen cosmonaut, along with a brief salutation of their bravery and sacrifice. In the Russian city of Penza, near one of the town's local high schools, a stone tablet bearing quotes from a Russian poet had been erected in honor of the cosmonaut's sacrifice. The lines from the poem read, Between our motherland and you, there is a two-way eternal connection. Nineteen eighty-six was a very busy year for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. They had fifteen missions in the works, including the first ever takeoff from their brand new launch site at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Other firsts included two fast, almost consecutive launches, the likes of which had never been attempted, while other NASA scientists worked on analyzing the incoming Halley's Comet and the launch of the state-of-the-art Hubble Telescope which would allow us to see into the far reaches of deep space. The first launch of 1986 took place on January 12th, but the second, which took off on the 28th, involved a space shuttle whose name would come to live in infamy, the Challenger. During its six-day mission, the Challenger's crew planned to deploy a large communication satellite. Once that was completed, they'd retrieve a highly valuable astronomy payload filled to the brim with data and statistics on the incoming Halley's Comet. Yet it was the third part of their mission that came to be of the most interest to the general public. In 1984, President Ronald Reagan announced the Teacher in Space Project, which, as you can probably guess, involved training a civilian educator to be an astronaut and then sending them into space. The idea was to not only demonstrate the safety and reliability of the shuttle program, but also inspire the next generation of astronauts while reminding Americans of what an important role their educators played. Quite obviously, it presented a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to teachers all over the country. 11,000 of them implied, but only one was chosen. Krista McAuliffe from Concord, New Hampshire. A NASA spokesperson stated that McAuliffe had an infectious enthusiasm, while NASA psychiatrist Terence McGuire told New Woman magazine that she was the most broad-based, best-balanced person of the ten. I cannot join the space program and restart my life as an astronaut, she said in a statement to the nation's media in the year following her selection, but this opportunity to connect my abilities as an educator with my interests in history and space is a unique opportunity to fulfill my early fantasies. Her planned duties included basic science experiments in the field of chromatography, hydroponics, magnetism, and Newton's laws. She was planned to conduct two brief school classes while in zero gravity, including a tour of the spacecraft that NASA called the ultimate field trip, along with a lesson regarding the benefits of space travel called Where Have We Been, Where We're Going, and Why. The lessons would broadcast to millions of school children via closed-circuit TV, which made Krista feel akin to, and I quote, a woman on the Conestoga wagons pioneering the West. On January 29th of 1985, NASA announced the five-person crew for the Challenger mission. Francis R. Scobie would take the lead, with the shuttle pilot being first-time flyer Michael J. Smith. They would be joined by mission specialists including Ellison S. Onizuka, Judith A. Resnick, Ronald E. McNair, Gregory Jarvis, and of course, Krista McAuliffe. Workers at NASA's Kennedy Space Center immediately began preparing the Challenger for its 10th journey to the stars, and the rollout to launch pad 39B took place on December 22nd, the first time the pad hosted a rocket since the Apollo-Soyuz test project in 1975. The following January, engineers at the Kennedy Space Center conducted a terminal countdown demonstration test, essentially a dress rehearsal for the countdown to the launch itself. The astronauts participated in the final stages of the test by climbing aboard the Challenger exactly as they would on launch day, with the countdown being halted just before ignition. After the successful test run, NASA set a provisional date of January 27th, but when the crew boarded the space shuttle for their first launch attempt, Mission Control suddenly canceled the launch due to a mechanical issue. The next day, the astronauts once again boarded the Challenger after NASA cleared them to launch. 
Yet this was in spite of unexpectedly cold temperatures overnight, which left significant amount of ice covering parts of the launch tower. This issue was raised at Mission Control, but NASA scientists appeared unconcerned, claiming that it would simply melt due to the heat of the launch. Yet, there was another issue. Behind the scenes, engineers had discussed the potential effects of frigid temperatures on their solid rocket boosters O-rings. Although they were built to withstand colder conditions, some engineers seemed unsure of the effect that prolonged exposure to ice would have on them. But once again, these concerns were dismissed by Mission Control, who cleared the Challenger for launch, and at 11.38 a.m. on January 28th of 1986, it fired its rocket boosters and headed for space. For the minute or so, the launch appeared to proceed normally as civilian observers photographed and filmed the shuttle during its majestic ascent. However, at exactly 73 seconds into the launch, those in attendance witnessed something truly shocking. The last recorded transmission from the Challenger came after a sharp drop in pressure from the shuttle's second liquid hydrogen tank. Pilot Mike Smith simply said, uh-oh, before Mission Control experienced a sudden loss of contact. One second, the Challenger and its launch rocket were steadily ascending into the heavens, then the next. It was gone. Those with high-powered optics, such as binoculars or telescopes, claim to have seen jets of flame bursting from the launch rocket's fuselage just seconds before the entire thing disappeared into a puff of smoke and steam. To those on the ground, the entire disaster unfolded in almost complete silence. Krista McAuliffe's parents and sister were among those in attendance, forced to watch as the daughter they were so proud of was snatched away in the blink of an eye. It took a good few minutes for the reality of the situation to set in. Most of those in attendance had no idea what the launch of a space shuttle looked like, so when the Challenger's launch rocket first exploded, most didn't actually realize what they were looking at. It took a NASA spokesperson announcing that there's been some kind of major malfunction for those in the crowd to realize what had happened. And when they did, the outpouring of emotion makes for some extremely difficult viewing. Over at Mission Control, the Challenger's flight director ordered that contingency procedures be put into effect, which included locking the doors, shutting down telephone communications, and freezing computer terminals to collect data from them. He then ordered a full investigation into what had happened to the shuttle. Investigators discovered that the crew cabin, which was made of reinforced aluminum, tore off as one complete piece at the time of the explosion. As it separated, its maximum acceleration is estimated to have been up to 20 times as strong as regular gravity. Obviously, these are incredibly strong physical forces, yet NASA scientists believe they were insufficient to cause any major injuries to the crew, and surmise that at least some of them were alive and at least briefly conscious after the shuttle broke apart. Investigators came to this conclusion after they discovered that the personal egress air packs had been activated for Smith, as well as two unidentified crew members. The location of Smith's activation switch, which was on the rear face of his seat, indicated that either Resnick or Onizuka likely activated it for him. While analyzing the wreckage, Investigators discovered that several electrical system switches on Smith's right-hand panel had been moved from their usual launch positions. The switches had lever locks on top of them that must be pulled out before the switch could be moved. This was taken as further evidence that at least some of the astronauts had been conscious well after they could have just as easily been killed. Later tests established that neither the force of the explosion nor the impact with the ocean could have moved them, indicating that Smith made the switch changes, presumably in a valiant but ultimately futile attempt to restore electrical power to the cockpit after the crew cabin detached from the main body of the shuttle. On July 28th of 1986, NASA employee and former astronaut Richard H. Truly released a report on the deaths of the crew that had been written by physician and Skylab 2 astronaut Joseph P. Kerwin. Frustratingly, Kerwin's findings were inconclusive, and although he worked tirelessly to put together the most comprehensive report possible, he only came to three major conclusions. The first was that the astronaut's cause of death could not be positively determined. The second 
was that the forces to which the crew were exposed during orbiter breakup were probably not sufficient to cause death or serious injury, and the third suggested that the crew lost consciousness in the seconds following the shuttle's breakup due to rapid depressurization. Kerwin seemed open to the possibility that his assumptions could be entirely incorrect, but it seems the third conclusion he made was motivated almost entirely by his desire to cause as little distress as possible to the families of the fallen. There's actually a good chance that the astronauts were able to maintain pressurization, at least through donning their helmets and closing the visors. But if this was the case, they could have quite easily remained conscious and alert during the entire duration of the fall, until the 207 miles per hour impact with the Atlantic Ocean ended their lives in the fraction of a millisecond. The day after the Challenger disaster, in his address to the American people, President Reagan paid an emotional tribute to the Challenger's crew. Quoting aviator and poet John Gillespie McGee, he says, We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them, this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slip the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. NASA also commissioned the construction of the Challenger Center for Space Science and Education, which opened its doors in 1988 and focused on space-themed learning and role-playing to cultivate students' skills for future success. To date, the center boasts a whopping 5.5 million visitors, many of whom journey from outside of the United States. Sadly, NASA canceled the Teacher in Space program in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, but introduced a second incarnation eight years later in the form of the Educator Astronaut Program. In 2004, Joseph M. Acaba, Richard R. Arnold, and Dorothy Metcalf Lindenberger became the first Educator Astronauts in almost a decade to travel into space. All three completed shuttle missions, with Akaba and Arnold also completing long-haul missions aboard the International Space Station. Every January, in the honor of those lost in the Challenger accident, as well as the Apollo 1 and the Columbia disasters, NASA holds a solemn day of remembrance. The event encourages NASA employees to reflect not only on the courage and sacrifice of those that came before, but also the circumstances that led to the accidents. The idea is to cultivate an environment of openness, accountability, and above all, safety. So that in the future, those who venture past the final and arguably most fascinating of frontiers can return home to tell their incredible, inspirational stories. Not as memorials, but as living, breathing authors of a new and exciting chapter in the story of mankind. At 10.39 a.m. on January 16th of 2003, the United States Space Shuttle Columbia took off from the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A, located on Merritt Island, Florida. Its mission was to carry three pieces of equipment into space, a space hab research module, an orbital acceleration research experiment, and an extended duration orbiter pallet designed to prolong astronauts' potential to live and work on NASA's Freedom Space Station. Heading up the team of astronauts was U.S. Air Force Colonel Rick Husband, while the pilot was U.S. Navy Commander William McCool. The payload commander was Michael Anderson, while Kalpana Chawla served as the mission's flight engineer. David Brown and Laurel Clark, both Navy captains, flew as the mission specialists on their first space flights. While Elon Raymond, a colonel in the Israeli Air Force and the first Israeli astronaut, flew as a payload specialist. The first minute of the launch went exactly as planned, but just 81 seconds into takeoff, a seemingly insignificant event would prove to yield unforeseen consequences. A piece of foam, approximately 65 centimeters long and 40 centimeters wide, broke off from the shuttle's left external tank. Footage shows the piece of foam coming loose before smashing into dust on the shuttle's left wing at speeds of up to 573 miles per hour. Mission Control did not notice the debris strike at the time, and after 43 minutes of constant ascent, the Columbia, quote, slipped the surly bonds of Earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. 
Following the Columbia's entry into orbit, NASA conducted a routine review of video footage taken from the launch. They very quickly noticed the debris strike, but since none of the cameras that recorded the launch had a very clear view of the foam striking the wing, Mission Control was unable to determine the level of damage sustained by the orbiter. NASA scientists believed that the space shuttle's reinforced carbon-carbon tiles could be damaged, and if this was true, the effect upon re-entry could be catastrophic. The reinforced carbon-carbon tiles used in the thermal protection system of the space shuttle played a crucial role in protecting it from the extreme heat generated during re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. The tiles are made of a composite metal consisting of interweaved carbon fibers, making it lightweight and capable of withstanding temperatures of up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Generally speaking, RCC tiles are installed on the leading edges of the space shuttle's wings and the nose cap, where the heat generated during re-entry was most intense and are critical in ensuring the space shuttle's safe return to Earth. If the RCC tiles were damaged, the crew of the Columbia could be in serious trouble, but incredibly, NASA program managers seemed unconcerned with the debris strike and called for the mission to continue as usual. To further analyze any potential damage, NASA enlisted the help of the Boeing Aircraft Company, who used high-tech computer software that could predict the levels of damage present on the Columbia's left wing. The software models predicted that the shuttle's aluminum skin would be unprotected in the area the debris had impacted, yet NASA's own debris assessment team dismissed this conclusion as inaccurate due to previous instances where the predicted damage was much less severe than what was actually present. Not only that, but maneuvering the orbiter to allow its left wing to be imaged would have interrupted or compromised their mission-critical science operations. Requests for additional imagery were declined, at which point NASA's debris assessment team did not make further requests for the orbiter to be imaged. As we've covered, those aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia were completely unaware of the post-launch debris strike, but when they were informed, it was only to downplay any risk associated with the strike. They were told that experts had reviewed the videos from the shuttle's takeoff and had expressed no concern of any structural damage. In light of that, the Columbia was cleared for its return to Earth and was scheduled to do so on February 1st, just over two weeks after it had originally taken off. When the time came, the crew successfully fired off the boosters which would take them out of Earth's orbit and having them descending into Earth's atmosphere which they did at exactly 8.44 a.m. Universal Time. Almost immediately, the damage to the shuttle's left wing allowed for intense heat to work its way into the substructure, and before long, its aluminum skeleton began to quite literally melt away. Heat sensors in the shuttle's wing activated an alarm system, both inside the shuttle as well as on the ground. The astronauts were in extreme peril. At 8.53, as the Columbia crossed over the California's coast, it was traveling at speeds of over 17,000 miles an hour. Seconds later, the shuttle began to break apart. Ground observers noticed a sudden increase in the brightness of the air around the shuttle. Casual observers didn't think much of it, but those with more experience knew something was terribly wrong with the shuttle's descent. As the Columbia traveled over Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and then Texas, Observers began seeing small pieces of debris falling away from the shuttle as it fell towards Earth. One such piece of debris was a tile from the shuttle's thermal protection system, which landed dramatically but harmlessly near the town of Littlefield, Texas. By this point, the crew were well aware that they were in serious danger. They attempted to correct the shuttle's orientation using the manual onboard system, yet the problem persisted. They then attempted to use the shuttle's thrusters in an attempt to do the same, but again, this failed to achieve the desired result. The Columbia's pilot, William McCool, maintained almost constant radio contact with mission control as he fought to keep the shuttle together, but at exactly 8.59 a.m., the Columbia's radio went silent. Seconds after the loss of transmission, and while traveling at speeds of up to 11,500 miles an hour, the plummeting Columbia began to rapidly rotate. The rapid acceleration the astronauts experienced would have caused a terrifying amount of dizziness and disorientation. Yet at exactly 9 a.m., 
the shuttle's autopilot was switched to manual control, then reset to automatic mode. This would have required the input of either Husband or McCool, indicating that they were still conscious and able to perform functions at the time. Either the captain or pilot were still alive exactly five seconds later when they attempted to restore the shuttle's hydraulic landing systems. It was the final act of any of Columbia's astronauts, and while valiant, it was ultimately futile. Eighteen seconds after the clock struck 9 a.m., the Columbia space shuttle completely broke apart, with the resulting rapid decompression taking the lives of all astronauts on board. Each piece of broken shuttle continued to break apart into smaller and smaller pieces, and within minutes, were too small to be detected by ground-based videos. By 9.35, all debris and crew remains were estimated to have impacted the ground. At approximately 9.06, when Columbia would have been conducting its final maneuvers to land, a mission control member received a phone call concerning news coverage of the orbiter breaking up. This information was passed on to mission control, and after the shuttle failed to land at the expected time of 9.16 a.m., NASA initiated contingency procedures as they began to accept the horrifying reality that all seven astronauts had been killed. As helicopter search teams scoured the shuttle's flight path with the intention of collecting up what remained of it, NASA investigators got to work determining the exact cause of both the shuttle's destruction and the astronaut's death. The first lethal event was quite obviously the depressurization of the crew module, but what became painfully obvious is that the astronauts had either not been wearing their helmets or had neglected to close the visor prior to descent. This indicated that depressurization occurred quickly before they could take protective measures, in other words, in mere fractions of a second. As the shuttle began to violently spin, the astronauts' shoulder harnesses were unable to prevent devastating damage to their upper bodies, and as the inertia reel system failed to retract sufficiently to secure them, the resulting trauma was nothing short of catastrophic. What's more, the crew's helmets had not been tailored to each of their specific sizes, meaning not only did they allow for serious head injuries to occur as a result of their skulls bashing off of each side of the helmet, but the neck ring might also have acted as a kind of hangman's noose, causing devastating spinal injuries. The astronauts also likely suffered significant thermal trauma both before and after their deaths. Investigators determined that, in all likelihood, hot gas entered the crew module as it began to rupture, burning the crew members in spite of the fact that their bodies were still somewhat shielded by their protective suits. Once the crew module fell apart, the astronauts were violently exposed to an unimaginably powerful wind blast, as well as possible shock waves so powerful that it tore the spacesuits from their bodies. It's also believed that whatever remained of them was then exposed to steaming hot gases and glowing hot molten metal as they tumbled away from the broken shuttle. By the time they hit the ground, there was very little left of them. On the afternoon of February 1st, just hours after hearing the news of the disaster, President George W. Bush Sr. addressed the American people via a live broadcast from the White House. My fellow Americans, this day has brought terrible news and great sadness to our country. At 9 a.m. this morning, Mission Control in Houston lost contact with our space shuttle Columbia. A short time later, debris was seen falling from the skies above Texas. The Columbia is lost, and there are no survivors. In the months after the disaster, the single largest ever organized ground search in U.S. history took place. NASA officials warned of the dangers of handling debris as there was a risk of it being contaminated by highly toxic propellants, but apparently, this didn't seem to deter a certain few. Soon after the accident, a group of unconnected but similarly motivated individuals attempted to sell pieces of the Columbia on the internet, including on the online auction website eBay. Officials at NASA heavily criticized those attempting to profit from a national tragedy and stated that the debris was both federal property and essential to the ongoing investigation. A three-day amnesty period was offered for recovered debris, and during that 72-hour window, almost two dozen different individuals contacted NASA to return the pieces of the shuttle. 
However, when this amnesty period ended and the items were found to have still not been taken off of eBay, several people were arrested for illegal looting and possession of prohibited government property. On March 27th, the death toll mounted when a search helicopter that was being used in the investigation crashed due to mechanical failure in the Angelina National Forest. The crash killed both the pilot as well as a Texas Forest Service aviation specialist, while three survivors were later recovered from the crash site. Officially speaking, the only survivors of the Columbia disaster were a group of C. elegans worms, which were found alive on April 28th of 2003. The worms are a kind of transparent nematode, about one millimeter in length, that live in temperate soil environments and were part of an experiment to research their growth while consuming synthetic nutrients. Enclosed in their aluminum canisters, the worms somehow managed to survive re-entry, as well as the powerful impact with the ground. On February 4th of 2003, President Bush and his wife Laura led a memorial service for the astronauts' families at the Johnson Space Center. Patti LaBelle sang way up there as part of the service, a choice that all found incredibly moving, giving the song's lyrical content. Several months later, on October 28th of 2003, the names of the Columbia astronauts were added to the Space Mirror Memorial at the Kennedy Space Center's visitor complex, alongside the names of 17 other astronauts. Trees representing each astronaut was planted in NASA's Memorial Grove, also at the Johnson Space Center, along with trees for each astronaut from the Apollo 1 and Challenger disasters. The following year, President Bush conferred posthumous Congressional Medals of Honor to all 14 crew members killed in the Challenger and Columbia accidents. It was a befitting tribute to the courage of those who volunteered themselves to be mankind's last great frontiersmen who dare to go where no man or woman has gone before. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or over email, and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button here on YouTube to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, you'll find me and my elegant worm enclosure.